All right. <clears throat> so let's record this and see where we are for today. Take a look at the Zoom meeting. So on the filament maker, moving forward, um, maybe Wes can provide an update on the electronics part. On a torch table, we're moving forward with the design, the CAD. Uh, that's the main development. So we're actually printing parts, some of the auto parallel mechanism. There's a final assembly that's in process. And that's useful to take a look at. In FreeCAD. We're redoing the axes for the larger for the larger well for the metal slash CNC plastic torch. composites of the CNC torch. Um, uh, I started with the second sprint with the second auto parallel mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, we need to print, still uh, printing some of uh, those uh, new quick motor flanged uh, pieces. So two completed, so we started the other two today. Yep, and uh, do we have more for the z-axis, but those would be regular, not flanged? Um, the, just the new type, but without the flange. Yeah. I think we have to print. Okay. So we can continue printing. Uh, those we can print on the, uh, on the universal. If it, if okay. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Um, yeah, so moving forward right on the, all the prints, then we can priority would be to, so we do have some of the prints already, so we can start assembling, reassembling. We've got one of the auto parallels, so we can hang at least the x-axis uh, after uh, the two y-axis, but the major milestone would be, okay, let's see how well the y is moving. So when we get out there, let's let's assemble that, right? We can, we can pretty much go forward with that. Mm -hmm. We've got, I mean, all the parts are there already, right? You just got to connect the belt. We redid, so we re redid the. Mm -hmm. I still have to move the um, positions of the, the, you know, the belt tightening. Belt tightening. Yeah, just. Well, I've done it on one plate, on one carriage, but on the other one, I haven't done it on the other one. Okay. Do we want to try and maybe run the first axis and just make sure everything is working like it should with that, and tension yeah. it and. Because that could give us feedback for if we're doing the second tensioning mechanism, if we've got to make any changes or anything like that. Okay. Let's do that because um, yeah. in the rapid prototyping sense, as soon as you build something, like, yeah, don't replicate further, just test that immediately as quickly as we can. So we can do that. Uh, test the just the Y1 axis by itself. So this one here in the CAD. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do that, because and that way we can basically clean up around the torch area and, and get everything pretty much into the final state. One thing we haven't talked about is things like, important things like the cable routing and cable chains. For it to be very functional, you do want to get a pretty good routing with the cable chains. We could probably revisit and maybe, maybe start printing that again, um, but there's some consideration we should definitely make for that. So. On one side, there's uh, after the Z with the, the basic torch setup and solenoids. Uh, I think the state of completion would be the, the Z probe that's retractable because we got a bed level. That's a definite one, but the basic gas system is just basic on and off. Uh, I don't really care about the igniter as the first step. We can add that, but initially, we want to make sure that. We got proper Z motion, proper Z leveling. Um, the gas turn on could be, I mean, the, the manual thing is the, is the first thing to test. Still, we don't have to worry about the gas solenoids. In fact, I would I would suggest we just do the as we mount the the torch. Since it's all disassembled, we might as well. Um, 
know, just try try the manual turn on right at the control panel. Uh, in terms of the progress of testing, because we haven't even shown that full fully working, and and if that's working, you know, we've got pretty much a ready torch table. In it, but the gas control is. Um, that we can test immediately after, I would say. Yeah. So as we put together the axes, yeah, just the basic, the basic system with the hoses, um, and hopefully, yeah. After we move the, uh, modify the second Y carriage, I mean, we can assemble everything back together, and it should go pretty quickly because now the pieces are pretty much for rapid connection, like the motors. We just put them on from the front. As far as the mounting the X between the Ys, that just screws through the side, like no, no messing around, just screws through the side, like no hidden nuts or anything, or, or excessive number of bolts like we're using right now with the, with the current Z mounting with the metal plates. That's I think we can bypass a lot of that with simplicity here. So yeah, in the next, next couple of days, hopefully run this thing. All right, um, so that's moving forward. So yeah, let's test the. the X, the, sorry, the Y1 first, and that, that makes us test the actual plug for the idler, like all those components which are which we haven't really tested yet. So we'll, we'll test the whole system on one axis and then move forward. Yep. Wes, you want to give us an update on um, the state of the uh, filament maker heat control code? I'd be particularly curious how you did. The <clears throat> Can you maybe give us a short lesson on, on how to modify the, the screen to do with the graphics like you did? Or that's too complicated to go um, through? Uh, I mean, that's something on the mm -hmm. I want a live demo. Well, I mean, I need to use my desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really want to do coding on my laptop. It's, it's, I just use uh, this library called UAG, uh, UAGT, I think. It's basically just... Uh, you ate a G, G? G T. It's like G -T? I just use a generic LCD rendering library, and I render the, an image and then some pixels, and some text. It's pretty. It's pretty straightforward. I'm not using more than it's just. Nice. How do you actually design the pattern? Like you have letters that are available. Well, I render some text by code, and then I, uh, and then I drew the drew the design with the base sprite. Which, like I said, and I could write this up on the wiki. Mm -hmm. It's kind of involved, right? Because there's like mm -hmm. dozens of steps to yeah. do this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can show. And what software you used? Uh, so I used this is some of this is on my work log, but I used um, Platform Platform Platformio. and it's it's just basically VS Code and C. Now VS the open source version, are you using the visuals? Yeah, VS Code is open source. Is it using VS Codium? Codium? Yeah, isn't that the open source version of it? Is there a closed source? Well, because there's, I, I looked at it and it said there's the, the one that Microsoft ships is, has got its proprietary stuff, so it's not clean. But there's uh, apparently some thing called VS Codium that it's so like Chromium is the open source version of it. Okay, I can try Chromium. You I see it? it just, yeah, I think it just installed VS Code by default, but mm -hmm. I was under the impression that the default VS Code is open source. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that uh, the default download adds is telemetry and tracking, so yeah. obviously I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> What's telemetry? Uh, telemetry... I believe it's like profiling. It's kind of like um, um, tracking the performance of software mm -hmm. in time. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Um... I, I will try Codium though, because I like VS Code, I like the color themes, I like yeah. the extensions. Yeah, and the platform I.O. seems to be interesting. When you ended up uploading to the Marlin, like, so platform I.O., like, what do you do there? You actually set, select, oh, this is Arduino 
environment kind of yeah, environment? It has a lot of default. It can build for a lot of open source boards. It's not like limited to Arduino stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, they automatically detect some stuff and other stuff you have to put in manually. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just build it up and upload it just a single button press. Yeah. I found it's easier, easier than Arduino IDE actually. Yeah. So I've never tried it before. Yeah. Uh, but for a novice, like probably not easier for a novice, or is it pretty much I as think, easy? I think. I think. I mean, I found it about the same. Difficulty. About the same. But I think there are advantages to going, not using Arduino IDE. As a more generic platform, yeah. it's true that if you could do several environments, because for example, what about like BeagleBone or Raspberry yeah, yeah, Pi yeah, exactly. and that, this would other devices. Would support those, yeah. those four boards and stuff. Or you could add support and stuff. And you can program in Python and VS Code easily. When you did your program for the Arduino Mega, is it largely using Arduino style commands or more C? Because, uh, I mean, Arduino environment is C, right? But it's got... I think it's C++, it's C++ but I mean, I mainly just programmed in C. And yeah, I use like, you know, like pin mode, digital write, some of the methods that are available. And I basically use Platform I.O. to in integrate some libraries that I needed, like the LCD. Mm -hmm. it, and those, I think, are just pulling Git projects or something. And I can publish all the source code for this, uh, like, sometime today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do that. That'll be useful. Now, um, as far as is there any visual editor where you can actually edit the LCD screen and then actually have it spit out the code um, for the image? No, but I could write it. I I just use a pixel art pro. I I do like pixel art, so I just use a pixel art. It's What's a it called? A sprite. A E S P R I T E. Uh, and I can post that on my log or whatever, but it's just a pixel art program for games and stuff. And since I'm a game developer, I made a lot of little pixel art games. So the pixel art you can export and that converts that to your C code? It is kind of weird. I had to copy the image into program memory. So I'm not loading a file or anything. I just paste it into the paste the image into the, the program itself. Kind of quirky how it works. Mm. Okay. That's how you can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be good. Like, um, we definitely want to build upon it, like, build our, as I mentioned, we want to do the brick press controller and other things using the little LCD because it's pretty convenient to do it. So, um, that would actually simplify the builds of, or like the integration of all the different control systems. Once again, going back to the universal controller and not using too many other specialized components. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that sounds good. Um, so I was going to write out of the code to hopefully interact with the LCD toggle button and, and do the target temperatures on the thermistors and then m maybe uh -huh. we'll get to the motor. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get to motor control from the universal controller today. Uh, you mean your custom, your custom version? Or are you talking about going? You're going back to Universal Controller with Mar not Marlin. You're just saying Universal Controller with your code. Yeah. Yep. Um, for example, if you do the LCD toggle button, so that that means things like libraries for that particular LCD screen. Yeah, I'd have to figure yeah. out how to do it still. Yeah. I, it'd probably just be a simple like library integration mm -hmm. the, the U, UAGT is like a generic um, r rendering library that works with multiple LCDs and one of them is the reference discount LCD right and then but if I wanted to use the, t the button on it it might require a more specific library just that works just for that LCD mm -hmm. I haven't I, I haven't looked into it yet I'll do it um, I'll do it today sometime yeah. Okay. I think it'd be really cool to have little GUIs for all the yeah. machines. Yeah. Yeah, it would be good if you can contribute some to that. That would be good. Well, I, 
I didn't fall asleep. I've been asleep until five in the morning, so sorry I missed it. The meeting. Yeah. Um, yep. Um. All right. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, and just brief discussion on you asked about the state of open hardware development. My comment on that is um, the thing that really needs to go forward in open hardware, in my view, is the, the enterprise part uh, because that's how people make a living out of this. Like the idea of, I mean, at the end of the day, like what are you doing for a living? Like if there, could, there is the potential of distributed market substitution idea that just about everything can be made better through collaboration and it's kind of an obvious argument shown in software not translated into hardware yet because of the long history of proprietary hardware starting from the industrial revolution um, but the potential is there but to date I, I mean I talked to I mean I talked to hundreds of open source projects and it's like nobody to date has come on board in terms of okay we're gonna explicitly talk about in an open project not like some small startup group or anything just an open project where you're actually moving forward on an enterprise that any one of the developers then can can then use and the idea there is well why make it like a kernel of a of an enterprise as opposed to oh we just bunch up in a in a startup garage and and do it well um, because you can provide more service to the world if you distribute that widely as opposed to okay here's one startup because once you go into the startup mode I mean typically there are no startups that collaborate openly so there's so the you have to make a choice do I go into this more closed way of development as a startup or an open open way and so far the open way is not nobody really gets it no, nobody really understands it and I haven't seen it happen anywhere but the potential is large because people can then rapidly and well anywhere in the world do the same thing so the economic output could be much greater uh, and in theory you can get more people to collaborate on that because everyone has access to this know-how and it also solves governance issues in that style of development where you develop a, an enterprise kernel because a lot of times it's like well how do we divvy up the loot once we make money kind of deal it's like all about all this stuff like who gets what value out of that project before there's even a product like that's we have plenty of those discussions here in the summer right and it's it's a wasted discussion because you cannot ever foretell the future what the future is going to bring so the only way you can really address it is okay we're going to say i will co collaborate openly we develop product anyone has access to it and you have to worry like if you're going to make money the money comes from your agency you have the avail availability of the enterprise materials like say the 3d printer and then from your initiative you can run that enterprise can you can run it in indonesia we can run it in america it's open to anybody so you don't get into the the divvy up the loot kind of uh the allocation like the, the payment discussions too early in the game which uh which in open source that's not part of it everyone contributes openly so that everyone can benefit do you think it's possible to be highly profitable with that model absolutely Absolutely, and, and the, the missing link is what I've said a hundred times, and it's people showing up. So how many people can actually show up to that development to get all those pieces ready? Like, for example, yesterday you popped in and you did the LCD for the, the filament maker. Well, man, that's okay. That's an enterprise asset that's towards that product we're developing. Uh, now we've got an LCD interface that's going to be better and so forth. So imagine that all kinds of people came into that project others in business development others in sourcing and marketing and all of that and uh, the thing actually becomes as quality as any kind of proprietary development and I think it's largely the cultural mindset that people are used to that way of thinking they're like well how am I gonna make money like everyone else has access I'm gonna get knocked out of competition um, but it can work for large market items 
where the markets are huge. Like, if Ken's running his printer in Indonesia, it does not affect what I do in America. So, it's like overcoming scarcity. Yeah. Some products are just so yeah. powerful. That, you know, there's, there's no limit to the number of to, ver or to very common things, like soda, open source carbonated sodas. That's actually a great example. I think that outside of the house, carbonated drinks with things like freeze-dried fruit powders, like natural drinks, are a huge can. It's a trillion dollar market. It can enable everybody to participate because everyone drinks drinks. And it's like the startup capital is not so huge. It's probably easier than the home, than the home project. But it could apply to anything. Like if Ken's gonna, uh, be making toilet paper in Indonesia not it doesn't affect what we're going to be doing here with that same product there's some products that um, have just huge markets so absolutely it can work but I mean I've talked about this to hundreds of people and so far not taken not having gotten a single taker uh, but what do we mean by this single taker someone someone who actually comes into that kind of environment well there's plenty of people that have no products and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Well, but they have no products. But once people get far enough and they actually have something very close to a product, initial prototypes and, you know, proofs of concept and actual working, working things ready for commercialization, it's like, nah, it doesn't happen. Um, it's a lot of it is the psychology that, okay, I put all this work into it and probably like no one helped me it's mine and nobody will share uh, but that's the whole mindset that the whole society is going forward with and it can certainly be overcome with an example or two of, to the contrary and for us it's still the house like I, I, I think it's still close and getting closer we're, we're close to that we got to finish this one um, start tours start getting orders and stuff like that and then we teach people how to build them and we say oh you can actually start up an enterprise like this elsewhere and things like that so and that's a more hard project because I mean house building is not easy as we know but uh, the concept co completely applies but is just unheard of just people are not ready for it yet it's a little bit of ahead of ahead of the time um, sure, sure, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'm on board with distributed enterprise, but, like, I'm trying to figure out the, the best, uh, the best way I can sort of accelerate or shift society towards this future. What do you think that would be? Yeah, and it's getting specific. Like, for example, on a house, maybe the specific angle we approach it from. Yesterday, I was looking at some of the numbers of what it would take to do off grid. Uh, but the solar power, like, maybe focus on okay, these are off grid capable homes that 
now instead of paying two thousand, like people pay two thousand to three thousand bucks on average for utilities, just electricity and gas. Per year. Per year. For per household. That's that's yeah. It's like, man. Well, I'll just put in an eight thousand dollar renewable energy system on a roof with with the photovoltaics and inverters and um, and actually the nickel iron battery I think is a good candidate. Design it for be for super efficiency using various techniques, like make it a really smart home, and then you're completely off grid capable. You're saving two thousand bucks a year, which adds up. I mean that in itself. So say say the house cost you a hundred k. But you know, every year you're saving two thousand. That that adds up, two thousand to three thousand on average. Sure, I think that's actually yeah. another viable uh, strategy for open sources. Rather than trying to earn money, you you literally just save people money. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you save enough money, you essentially you can earn like half the economy if you reduce half the cost. <laughs> no, it's true. Else. It's I mean, in energy efficiency, the, they always say it's like, yeah, you can be talking about different technologies, but efficiency is like the number one thing. And this is what we can but like apply here, too. For like the housing like, and the ecology aspect in general, I think it's difficult because like, there's a, a lot of design work in like these in systems when oh, you yeah. start to like integrate lot disparate systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It starts to become like if you're building a house now it's way more capital intensive than if I'm building a microscope or a 3D printer. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. more difficult to form a business model on that. And I was thinking like, well soft costs so the thing is like it's a hard because software has such it's such accessible startup costs. It's yeah. essentially free to to start up software based. Mm -hmm. And the hardware is just it's, uh, it's, it's just scary. Yeah, but I mean, look at even the house. Like, if the model evolves to, to reputation sufficient that you're getting the money up front, you get a client, you, get, you become a custom builder, for example. Not like speculative housing where you build it, put it on a market, and wait to get paid, like however long it takes to get sold. Here you're talking about, okay, client, they pay you. Sure, but you have to have money. Have money. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people, these people can, like the people, the target market maybe has $700 a month, right? And then how do you get the funding up front if they've only got $700 a month? Cross subsidize by, yeah, if that's the main market, there's no money there, but then you get a client or two that, so have some richer clients that actually have money or just enough to pay for it up front or half of it up front so you can actually without an, any outlays. I don't think that's, a viable, or, think that's, that's a, a viable model though. Why not? If you develop it... It's because a, a, really well, a wealthy person would probably want like a, a bigger house, a more, right. more expensive house, and if they can afford a down payment on that. That's true, but, but it's not necessarily that the, the special market segment would be those people that have I do have the money, but I also are in the <laughs> nature of downshifting that they don't want that cookie cutter McMansion that's five hundred thousand dollars. They actually want want to say, hey, I want to save. I, I don't want to have this burden. So they have to be different thinkers. So maybe there's not enough people like that. I don't know, but <coughs> somehow, well, um, what's our greatest chance of making this work? It's like it <laughs> to the point of people getting finance. Like if a person pays. 700 or 1200 in rent, uh, they can typically get financing. So that will be the part that's accessible because if you pay that much rent, you can get a bank loan too, typically. So that, there's a clear, there's definitely a clear route that just by bank financing, you can, you can make it happen too. But maybe we start up, a, I just ran into, Always the the idea of drinks like carbonated drinks or even water, which does relate to our stuff, like including the, the house, because eventually we'll have the uh, water purification systems that get you to potable water and stuff like that. Anyway, um, back to the filament maker. So, um, 
campus. So what are your next steps on on that? To uh, plug in the new firmware, we can set the, the temperature setting. And then see how, well, probably fixture the auger somehow. Uh, first. But what I hope to do is to heat it up sufficiently that the back pressure won't be as high. Oh yeah, and uh, we learned uh, uh, polycarbonate it is, so 260 to yeah. 290, which the higher temperature will get rid of a lot of that. But yeah, it was pretty amazing to, sh to see that that amount of back pressure. Now, if you look at the absolute numbers, we said something like 170 like kilogram centimeters or something with, uh, with that motor to torque. So let's just take a look at that figure real quick for what was happening there. Um, the spec is 173 kilogram centimeters. Yeah, that's a lot what that means. If you're spinning and actually biting into and pressing down with the flutes, an equivalent opposite force, like, okay, yes, it's rotation, but rotation that is a screw, it, the the resulting force, reactive forces upwards, uh, on the order of this kind of number here. So we would be pressing like a hundred kilos onto the structure where we're mounting the motor. Yeah, no wonder that the structure we have broke. That that explains it. Uh, so there is pretty good force here. Uh, so we, yes, we have to reinforce. Um, yeah, so since it's loose, but hopefully it just won't have that sort of back pressure again. Right? Yeah, yeah. So once we get to the higher temperature, um, and we just want to be careful that we don't start burning things. So lower the temperature if we get start to see any traces of darkness there. Um, so start by start by increasing the temperature. Yep, get the temperature dialed in. And, uh, and using the current code that, that Wes has? Or? Yeah, it's the best working okay. version, yeah, for sure. And how do you set the actual, can you use, you're not using the knob to set it, are you? Okay, so right now you're just saying, you're just setting it through code to set it to 240? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe just get it set to, I don't know, like 275? Program the target. We can set the target from the LCD. Yeah, yeah. and then in the future he could probably put in ABS setting, uh, PLA setting. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now you don't have the LCD active, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do we have any pictures of that? I, I didn't take any pictures of the LCD screen and stuff. Mm. Can you get some ones that's, let me, well, let's yeah. get it up like I have a little video. operational and then I kind of want to. Yeah, we got we got a picture of the code. Right? Yeah, upload the video to the the Google Drive there, if you can. Um, what else to cover regarding the temperature? Mm. We should add um, three thermistors and three heaters, or just to work with two. I mean, the main thing that the main issue now is there's uneven distribution or some of the heaters um, like transfer heat around so I mean we had it stable yesterday but it's kind of weird how both the misters were placed in the same place. Oh the current design? Yeah I kind of thought we were going to place one like towards the top and one towards the bottom. Yeah so the reason they're placed like that is to have one under and one above. Um, the plan was just to run one heater, so I just want to have a good... Okay, so uh, we will move one up. Yeah, because we'll never have the higher temperature above the heating element, but have below, and have a problem. Yeah. So I just want to be able to... Do you, I mean, uh, from the force on applied to the uh, motor, it seems like maybe we should melt it a little bit more. Do you think that should be done just by increasing the temperature on the bottom heaters, or by moving the heat further up? Uh, we need to keep the heating element at the bottom, but we can add intermediary heating steps further up. Although, I don't think there's much fric friction with the cold the polycarbonate, 
So our issue was mainly that it was 30 degrees too low. Maybe we're just too, um, the arc was spinning too quickly as well. Well, that's dependent on sort of resistance, but no. No. Well, we'll so see, but we, we need to... We'll stick with two. Yeah, we'll, s we'll see, but we needed to flow efficiently first. Are we doing the aluminum foil wrap? Yes, or we are. Yeah. Yeah. Is that to replace that burned insulation? No, it was to widen the, the tail end of it, the last piece, so that I could wrap the heat around it. So that it otherwise it would be air gap insulated. We're still using the fiberglass insulation tubes. Mm, yes. So is that the burn? Are we use is that the burn insulation? The stuff that caught on fire? Or is that what it is? That's the so what's, so what's that insulation? Are we gonna are we gonna remove that? So the fiberglass is lower temperature than the rock wool based. Yeah, yeah. And we should grab some of the, the brown What's rock wool based. Yeah, I think it's stabilized. What if we have a new insulator that will withstand 500 Celsius? Um, it's probably the... Yeah. I think we should get aero gel. I think that will be cool. Oh, and that's yeah. actually true how much it costs. So, right, so, so I uploaded so a picture to Google for or the video. Is that a frog? Yeah. Still in the cupboard? I haven't been able to find him. I'll oh, sometimes hear him around. Yeah. I'm surprised he's still alive. He should, he should be getting bigger, so. <laughs> Maybe eating wolf spiders and. <laughs> yeah, probably are. Filament! Custom Alawes firmware. Motor still going strong, a little slow. Filament definitely coming out white. Alright. Um, S firmware. Motor still going strong. Custom. Um. The location of the thermistors, how, what's our strategy right now? We have one right next to the metal, all right? Or how? They're all if you look at metal, metal, there's just different layers of it. Uh, so if we look at the last picture that I uploaded, uh, the change bin is a bit placed. So in the lowest level of the folder maker, that's where I placed one thermistor.